Good evening. Go ahead and open up your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. I'm going to talk to you tonight about Jehoiakim's rejection. Jehoiakim's rejection, and really, it wasn't just his rejection, uh, but it was the rejection of the entire uh, southern kingdom of Judah, of the Word of God. And when you've got Jeremiah 36, say amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Our Lord, we do thank you for, uh, once again, the opportunity to come and meet together in the house of God. We just pray that as we open our uh, Bibles this evening and as we turn our hearts and our minds to the Scripture, that, uh, Father, you would just take away, uh, Lord, whatever uh, disturbing thought, whatever distraction that we had uh, throughout the day or, uh, or in days past, Father, whatever maybe even we're worried about next week, just pray that you'd help us to focus on the moment, help us to focus on the Word of God, uh, and the lessons that you'd have for us, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I like Jeremiah 36. The book of Jeremiah was a tremendous uh, blessing to the prophet Daniel. He studied it all the while while he was in uh, Babylon in those early years, and uh, many people have benefited from it since. Um, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah called the weeping prophet, and here we find out why. Uh, just a sort of a, a brief rundown in chapter number 36. Uh, how would you like it if nobody ever listened to a word that you had to say? I mean, what kind of a career do you think you would have if your entire uh, purpose or the entire goal of your, of your job, of your ministry, was to give a particular message or talk to people and no one ever listened? Uh, so much so that he uh, penned his lamentations and uh, they were originally one book probably in the Hebrew scripture and we have it as two in our English Bible. But um, this passage here before us right now in Jeremiah 36 reads like some sort of a legal brief and I believe that it is. As we go through it, we're going to take a look at all 32 verses, don't worry, we're going to look at all 32 verses tonight, um, but uh, it reports some very important events, some very crucial events right in the last days of uh, Judah's history as a kingdom before they went into Babylonian exile. Uh, Jehoiakim was uh, the son of Josiah, the last good king they had. Uh, Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years and uh, then after that um, we had uh, a three, little, just over three months rule by his son Jehoiachin and then uh, uh, Jerusalem went into exile and Zedekiah was put into place and uh, he reigned for a brief period of time. But uh, uh, really, as we get toward this tail end of the monarchy there in, in, uh, in Judah, we see that uh, the, the, that monarchy decreased in quality as it did in, in the span of the reign of the kings. And this here is sort of a, almost like a judgment against it. As we read this passage here in chapter 36, we notice that uh, it's very specific in its wording. It pays specific attention to dates, to people, and just to make sure that there's no uh, misunderstanding as to who we're talking about, key people have just a brief genealogy given. Uh, such and such, the son of such and such, the son of whoever. And we see that briefly uh, as sort of uh, peppered throughout the passage here. And it's very short uh, sentence structure sometimes. And, and, and the high points are, are the simplest things to, to see and to understand. As we read here in just a moment, that will sort of jump out at you. And uh, if you would uh, sort of skip down here to verse 32, it's the last verse in the chapter. Uh, it says this, Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Nera, there we go again, who wrote therein, from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim the uh, king of Judah had burned in the fire and there were added besides them many like words. You know probably because uh, because God had spoken said everything that I've spoken to you everything that's come to my mouth concerning the judgment of Judah and Israel and the rest of the nations since the time of jo Josiah the king on up to today he said I want you to write in this book and so Jeremiah wrote it and we'll see that that was destroyed and then he he wrote it again and it says uh, and many like words 
know, we think that probably the many like words are the, is this 36th chapter here. You know, that sort of comes uh, explaining what happened to the book the first time it was written. What happened to those writings? They weren't received well. But here if we just kind of read a little bit here, starting in verse number 1, it says this, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book. When it talks about a roll, it's talking about a scroll. Okay, they wrote in scrolls back then. And, um, uh, you know, like, like as we see today, um, the book of Moses. The Bible talks about the book, singular, of Moses. We talk about the books of Moses. Moses wrote one book, but one book was divided into five parts. And uh, we call that today the Pentateuch, or the first five books of our, uh, of our Bible. A Bible that looks like this is called a codex. That means it's got pages that flip back and forth. Used to be when they had books, it was just a scroll. And so these scrolls could only be so big to be carried. You know, they'd only had a little, you could only make them, you know, a, a, limited, uh, a limited width when they were all rolled up or it was hard to carry. And so it, maybe that book of Moses was broken down into five different books, but it was considered one work. And uh, so when he says here he had a roll, it's talking about a scroll there. Um, it says, And write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. And so... Uh, Basically, this happened, but in verse 9, if you'll skip down, it says this, And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. There it is again, that pinpointing, dates, names, lineages. In the ninth month that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to the people, uh, uh, to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah and Jerusalem, then read Barak in the book, the words of Jeremiah. So he says, uh, so in other words, we're in the fourth year where the Lord said, write all this stuff down. And then he wrote it down. And then he waited till uh, in the fifth year, uh, sometime afterwards, to go ahead and present it. How many times have you, have you ever had it true in your life that uh, uh, maybe God tells you to do something or, or there's some specific thing God would have you to do and, and yet maybe right then and there wasn't the time. You know, typically we think of, uh, of obedience in terms of something that it's got to happen now. And yet we find that Jeremiah here, and you know, uh, not only Jeremiah, but Nehemiah also waited until the proper moment. Nehemiah was burdened to talk to the king about what was going on back in Jerusalem upon their return out of exile. And uh, Jeremiah here was burdened by the Lord to write just a brief chronicle of all the prophecies of God so that when the people meet, they could be read. But the timing wasn't right. See, and Jeremiah understood that, and he, he waited for the timing. When they had called this fast day, they were all gathered together at Jerusalem for this fast day. And uh, something to understand is that probably prior to Babylonian exile, fasts were not a regularly appointed part of their life. That came about after the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, feast days were regular and appointed, and Sabbaths regular and appointed, but those fast days, they typically only had them in times of national emergencies or crises. And uh, if we, we read, and, and there's a, a, a work called the Babylonian Chronicle, that uh, is, is, it's an extra biblical source, but it, you know, if we match up the dates and kind of compare, we find that around this same time, this fifth year of Jehoiakim, Babylon had just taken Ashkelon. That was over on the sea coast, over by the Mediterranean Sea, not all that far away, really, and so they're kind of being worked around in this national fast day may have been a response to that particular crisis. It may have been a, a plea to God, uh-oh, we got to get together and fast because Babylon is practically at the gates. And it was at this time that Jeremiah said, now, it's perfect. They've come to Jerusalem, they're, they're looking to God, it's, the time is now. At least that's what was supposed to happen. But Jeremiah knew when to speak. Nehemiah knew when to speak. It might even have been because of Jeremiah's writing right here that, the, uh, that, that, that Nehemiah understood the importance of waiting for the right time. 
You know, a burden from God to act is never a license to act without wisdom. You know, sometimes we we get a burden from the Lord or a plan. Uh, God speaks to us from some passage of Scripture and they praise God, I'm just going to do it and it's going to happen right now. And, and you know, bless God, if they can't handle it, it's just because they're rebelling against the Word. And No, no. Sometimes <clears throat> things fall through because we don't exercise wisdom. Amen. Sometimes things fall through because our timing is not God told us what to do, but marching orders may come a little bit later. And uh, Jeremiah understood that. We've already read those first few verses here, but, but uh, it, we'll, we'll kind of go over them again. But point number one this evening, if you're taking notes, is that we see the Word of God delivered. We see the Word of God delivered. It says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this Word came from Jeremiah, uh, unto Jeremiah, from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, uh, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I propose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Do you understand? Babylon was right at the door, coming up. We're just we're a, we're a mere months away from a siege. Uh, there, that first initial siege of Babylon, uh, uh, by Babylon of Jerusalem, and we're writing things down. And then, when the time is right, they'll be read. And God, uh, looking forward, says it might be. That we're just going to give them, and maybe, in other words, we're going to give a chance for repentance. Or we're going to give them a chance to come back to me, and uh, so I can forgive their iniquity and their sin. In the verse number four, then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, "I am shut up; I cannot go." into the house of the Lord. Uh, probably we think that by this time in his ministry, people had gotten so sick of hearing uh, the, the unpopular and the negative messages of Jeremiah that they, they barred him from the temple. They said, you can't come around here preaching that negativity uh, too long. Uh, you, we don't want you around here anymore. Uh, you never give us a good report, Jeremiah. There's always something, all this doom and gloom, and uh, we'd much rather feel good when we leave the house of the Lord. Can you imagine that a day and a time when God's people no longer hear his word in his own house? Look around you. Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people. Now you listen, pay attention to the detail here, folks, the detail. He, said, he keeps going, God gave him the word and he spoke it by his mouth and the other fella wrote it down with his pen. And here again we have the process repeated that you wrote which I spoke and speak it into the ears of the people. We're not leaving any room, no wiggle room here. There's no wasted language, but he's very, very specific. He said, Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be they will, present, uh, they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return everyone from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against this people. And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book of the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people of Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. Then read Baruch. So we go from the general. Basically it says that God said this and, and they said yes sir. And then they prepared the thing. And, and now then at the fasting day. 
God says there's going to be a day of fast, and I want you to read that. Now, here in Jeremiah's prophecy, he says, Then, at the fasting day, read Baruch in the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court, that would be the inner courts, <clears throat> at the entry of the new gate in the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. When Micaiah, son of Gemariah, son of Shaphan, there are those genealogies again. We're not, we don't want you to mistake who's involved and how they're involved. Heard out of the book of all the words of the Lord. Then he went down into the king's house, into the scribe's chamber, and lo, all the princes sat there. Even Elishama, or Elishama the scribe, and Deleah the son of Shemaiah, and Elnathan the son of Akbor, and Gemariah the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. Now did you just see what happened there? Isn't that, you know, they, they declared a national day of fasting. <clears throat> and all the people are gathered together at the Lord's house. And then after the service, he says, hey, uh, there's some folks that need to hear this. They need to know. Because did you notice the nobility wasn't in the house of the Lord? They were gathered together in the king's house. They're sitting there, and the, and, and, and the king's there too, but they're gathered together. Why wouldn't they be in the house of God on a fast day, on a national day of fasting? Who proclaimed the fast? A thing like that would have to come from the top down, or they wouldn't open the temple for it, and it wouldn't be a national day of doing so. And so we have some people here, some, some leaders that were uh, uh, not quite practicing what they preach. They said, hey, we got to get together and uh, uh, there's a national crisis. Babylon is at the gate. It's just a few miles away and, and uh, we need to be praying and seeking God. And everybody was there praying and seeking God except the leaders were off in the king's house. Then Micaiah declared unto them all the words that he had heard when Baruch read in the book in the ears of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudi, the son of, Nathan, uh, son of Nathaniah, the son of Shelemiah. There's a lot of Hebrew words here. <laughs> the son of Cushai unto Baruch saying, Take in thine hand the roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people and come. So, uh, he read in the ears of the people. The word got back and they said, hey, there's this fellow up there named Baruch and he's been, he's been uh, uh, speaking the words, of, uh, the words of the prophet Jeremiah and here's what he said. And the princes said, really? Bring it here. We want to read this ourselves. We want to hear this for ourselves. It sparked something. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Baruch read it in their ears. Now, now that's a very short interchange. Come, read it in our ears. And then so the, uh, the narrator now says, So Baruch read it in their ears. Again, uh, a very detailed accounting of everything that happens. So now it came to pass... When they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and another, and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king all these words. Now, the word of God has been delivered. It's been delivered to the people. Now, the people were praying, first of all. I want to think about something. All the folks were gathered there at Jerusalem. Now, did the, did the people repent when they heard the prophecy of Jeremiah? Say no. No. They didn't. Look, if they had, Babylon would have been stayed. It just says that. That says God's intent right here. Look, if they'll just, you know, if they'll repent, they'll be a little getting right here, then I can, then I'll, uh, we'll put off this thing and, and it won't have to happen yet. But, <clears throat> but there was no repentance because it did happen. It happened right then and there. But understand something the people were supposed to be fasting. They were supposed to be praying. Uh, they knew something bad was at hand, uh, but they never responded to the message. There was something bad at hand, and now the Lord says the timing's right. They see what's going on off here in the distance. Ashkelon has fallen, and there's uh, Babylonians practically at the gate. 
little ways off yet, but it's not going to be long. They're, they're gathered together. They proclaim the national day of fast. Uh, Jeremiah, write all those things down in a book, and let's go get them the whole account so they can see what's going on. And then he went and he gave them the whole account. And we're not told what the exact reaction was there, just that this fellow got up and he went and he told all the nobles who were gathered somewhere else. But, but here's the thing. If the people had responded they wouldn't have gotten themselves in the fix they were about to go. The word of God had failed to land on caring ears in the people, and so uh, by sovereign guidance, the Lord next addresses the princes and the nobles. He said, well, the people aren't going to listen. Let's try the leadership. You know, if I can't get everybody together, maybe I can uh, spark an interest in the hearts of uh, some of their local politicians and maybe uh, they'll encourage people to get right. If they're not going to listen to a preacher, maybe they'll listen to that politician they put so much trust into, so much faith and confidence in, right, wrong, or indifferent. They went to the house of the Lord. It was a national day of fast, but they didn't want to hear the answer. And when the answer came, it was refused. But the word of God was faithfully delivered. And now if you're taking notes tonight, the second point you can see is that the word of God was dismissed. <laughs> the word of God was dismissed. <clears throat> and we just read into that a little bit there. Uh, but the word fear, that's describing the princes and the nobles, was not of the godly sort, but of cowardice. See, they said here, well, they were afraid when they heard about all these bad tidings, uh, and they sort of matched that up in their head, and it made sense because it was the whole reason people were having that national day of fast, was that something was coming, and then they saw what it was, and then there comes the word of God backing it up, saying, yeah, you remember, I talked about this. But now they had a problem. Now they had to go tell the king. Now they had to go tell someone who uh, did not want to hear it. Go flip back just a little bit to Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah 26. You know, and we'll, we'll listen here. We'll kind of look at verses uh, uh, 20 through 23. It says here, And there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of Kirjath-Jerim, <laughs> who prophesied against this city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. So he's speaking the, prophets of, the prophecy of Jeremiah. And when Je uh, Jehoiakim the king, Jehoiakim the king, with all his mighty men and all the princes, hearing his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. And Jehoiakim the king sent men into Egypt, namely Elnathan, his name's important here in a bit. El Nathan, uh, the son of Akbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. And they fetched forth Urijah out of Egypt and brought him unto Jehoiakim, the king, who slew him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Is it lost on anyone tonight that this is the son of Josiah? You know, the godly ruler, well, not perfect, but he walked in the ways of the Lord. When Josiah heard the word of God read, he rent his clothing. He, 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 he declared mourning nationally and did everything that he could to get right with God. This fellow here hears the word of God, proclaims, and says, we need a hate crime law. We can't have words like that flying around. And when they heard these things, the nobles gathered together. Uh, they said uh, they feared greatly, but it was a form of cowardice. They didn't want to be the one to go give the king more bad news. The same one he just killed another prophet. They said, here we go again. And, uh, you know, it might be us too. Because Elnathan was one of the people in the group that heard about this bad news. And so this was the second instance of an un... 
un-anything. If you can think of a good word, just stick un in front of it and, and think of the reception that the word of God was getting in the day. Now, I like what comes next. They said uh, here, just in that last part of verse 16, we will surely tell the king of all these words. But in verse 17, they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Now think about that question. They just told him, well, I, I, this is the word of Jeremiah the prophet. Okay, probably known uh, because they knew that he had copied them from somewhere. But look at his response. This is beautiful. <laughs> Then Baruch answered them, verse 18, he, he answered them and said, well, it's like this. He pronounced all of these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. I think it was a stall tactic just so they could decide whether or not what they really heard was what they really heard and, and maybe they're trying, just needed some time to think about what to do with this. And so, you know, sometimes awkward silence makes for a very stupid comment by otherwise intelligent people. Here they've just received all this prophetic warning and they say, uh, now, uh, now how did you hear this again? You know, it's a reflex question. And so uh, Baruch says, well, uh, uh, Jeremiah and I were in the room uh, together there, and, uh, you know, and, and I had a pen, and, uh, and he had a mouth, and he started uh, talking, and I was writing, and uh, there was ink involved. You know, sometimes we want to make things more complicated than they really have to be when we don't appreciate or don't like something that the Word of God says, and we find it today, too, you know, when the Word of God says something, all the, immediately people, well, now, 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 wait a minute, now, how did that come to be written? Well, it was very simple. God had a prophet with a mouth, and he had somebody else with a pen, and he wrote it. You know, you might think of it in this day uh, as, uh, what, now, uh, what does all this mean? So, well, I'll tell you, fellas, it means what it says. We're in for a problem if we don't get right with God. You know, I ask a stupid question. But they were skeptical. It was a reflex. The reflex of a hardened heart is always to question the source of anything uh, from God's word. Flip through your Bible. I don't care what kind of a Bible you've got. If you've got a Bible with usually, generally speaking, so much as a center column reference, you'll find something in there somewhere uh, that some genius has written that says, well, now we don't really know if this is what was actually supposed to have been in the book. Well, the problem being that if you don't really know what was actually supposed to be in the book here, how do you know that something else wasn't supposed to be in there? How do you know there's something that was supposed to be in there that wasn't? See, you've got to completely disregard the sovereignty of God in the preservation of his word before that kind of a question can even come into your mind. Uh, and we already see here what kind of people are starting to ask these questions. The people that weren't in the house of God with everybody else praying and seeking the Lord, they were off on their own uh, doing their own thing in the side chamber of the king's house. But they did not want another messy slaying of a prophet on their hands. So they told him, go hide. Verse 19, Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go, hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. And they went into the king, and they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king. You realize that there's, every time we hear something, we see a connection. Words going to ears. Words going to ears. And at first, uh, uh, Baruch reads in the temple. And somebody goes 
And he passes along uh, to the nobles. Hey, let me tell you what was happened. Again, words into ears. And the first thing they say is, wait, 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 wait. Bring the book and read from that. And now here, uh, the nobles are going to the king and they're telling the words into his ears. Again, a sort of a hearsay account. Words into ears. And the king has the same response. Says, wait, 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 wait. Bring me the book. And so there's this sort of a pattern that we see of the word is read and heard and shared and reread and shared and reread. It's, uh, it goes back from, from spoken testimony to written word. And you know, can I say something? That's the way God's word ought to act. That's the way it ought to be with us. Hey, if you read something out of God's word and you pass along a blessing or, you know, maybe it happens to be uh, a cursing upon your life. Maybe God's showing you something that needs to change or better change or ought to change a long time ago, but you read it and you pass that on. So you know what? God showed me this. He said, I've, I've, I've got this wrong in my life. There's this particular idol that needs to come down. There's that particular television show that needs to stop getting watched. Amen. And then maybe say, wait, 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 wait. bring that book here. Let me have a look at that. That's the way it goes. And it ought to be uh, widely received. The problem here is that it was widely rejected. Now we know that because of what's coming off next. They dismissed it. The people dismissed it. The princes, we'll see in a minute, didn't really hearken to it either. And uh, that kind of brings us to the third point is that we see the word despised. So we see the word was delivered and the word was dismissed and now the word is despised. So if we pick up here, we'll just pick back up here in verse number 20. Then they went into the king and to the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehude uh, to fetch the roll and he took it out of Elishama the scribe's chamber and Jehude read it in the ears of the king. There it is again. Read into the ears, spoken into the ears, from the mouth to the pen to the mouth to the ears. And in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king, so they were getting it a second time. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was before, uh, a fire on the hearth burning before him. Chilly winter day, he had a fire going. And it came to pass that when Jehudi, or Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the roll was consumed, till all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Now, so they wrote in columns on the scroll. And he'd unroll the scroll and he'd read a few columns. And the king would take a penknife and say, zip! Crumple it up and throw it in the fire. Keep going. Can you imagine the brazen nature of any leader who would take the time? And you know, he didn't wait till the whole thing was finished. He didn't throw the whole book in the fire at, the, at, at one time. He didn't even tear it up with his hands. He used a pen knife. That's an instrument of the scribe, which is used to trim uh, or, or, or square or work with uh, the, the, the material in the scroll. He used a scribe's tool to try to get rid of the word of God. He cut it up paragraph and section by paragraph by section and threw it into the fire one at a time. Again, there's a stark contrast which Jeremiah shows us between Jehoiakim's court and Josiah's court. Josiah's court heard the law of God and they rent their clothes. This court heard the law of God and they tried to rend the word. Will not change the way we're doing business. We don't need that Bible stuff in here. And it came to pass that when Jehudi read three or four leaves. He cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid nor rent their garments. And there he's, he's hearkening back. Again, the, the, the reader would have in mind that this was the son of Josiah. Folks, we miss it today when we just read our Bible page by page, chapter by chapter. Uh, but there are changes that go on there, genealogies, and, 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 and we're to keep that in mind as we read. This was the son of a great man. 
Not perfect, maybe, but, but a good king. And he specifically says here he didn't rend their garments. There's no remorse there, no godly sorrow. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deleah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. So here are some people that are at least level-headed enough. This is an outrageous, almost childish thing to do. I don't like the words of that book. Throw that book away. I don't like what it says about me. I don't like what it says about the rule. Uh, let's throw it in the fire. Uh, we don't need it. You know, they, they, uh, communists still try to burn books. Don't want somebody telling me that my kingdom is about to fall because I'm not listening to some God that I don't believe in anyway. But there were a group of nobles standing by who said, Well, no, 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 wait, no, wait, don't, you shouldn't be doing that. And he didn't listen. Were they repentant? No. Did they fear God? No. But something in the back of their head at least drummed up the courage for them to say, nah, nah, <laughs> wait a second, now don't start messing with that. And he didn't listen. But the king commanded Jeremiel, the son of Hamelech, and Sareah, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdeel, to take Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Here we have the princess saying, go hide yourselves, quick. And here it says that the Lord blessed that effort. <laughs> Basically, it said the Lord hid them. He said, no, they're not going to get caught here. They're doing what I said to do. They have a message for you. And folks, listen, you ought never be afraid to speak truth to power. You know, there's a way to do it. We learn that there's a time to do it. There's a wisdom in how it needs to be done. But that's so that it can have maximum impact. God knows his timing. He knows his target. But have you noticed? He said, look, I'll start with the people. If the people will just get right, we'll go. But, but the people did not get right. They didn't take it seriously. And so the next uh, audience was the princes and the nobility. And, and they didn't know what to do with it either. All they could think about was getting in trouble with the king. So now it, it comes to target the king. Let's see if the king will do right. But the Lord had hid the prophet and his messenger. I want to close this evening just by reading verses 27 through 32. It says here, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll. The Lord said, Write it again. And write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. Now, and thou shalt say to Jehoiakim the king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land and shall cause uh, to cease from thence man and beast? Now, why are you trying to stir up all these problems? People are happy here. We've got a day of fasting going. We're the people of God. These people won't make any difference. This man had the same problem that Habakkuk had. Lord, I just don't get it. Why are you using these people to judge your righteous people and the word of the Lord on that issue is basically because I can therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David and his body shall be cast out in the day of the heat and in the night of the, uh, to the frost in the day of the heat and in the night to the frost and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity and will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearkened not. So they didn't listen the second time either. Now we come back to verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah. 
who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And there were added beside them many like words. This is an account of what happened before. Probably the words that he wrote were somewhere between Jeremiah 1 and chapter 26, maybe a little further there, but we, we read here in verse 36, he says, here's, here, here's an account of, of what they did to the first copy that I wrote. And it's a, it's a, it's a legal document. It's a, it's a notice of condemnation. We're starting out, God said to his prophet to write the words, and the, the prophet, this was the name of the prophet's secretary, and this was the date, and this was the, the people that were shown, and this was their response, and this is what they did, and here's what the prophet did next. And, and after that transpired, he wrote it all down again, and, and, uh, and, 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 and here's the verdict. And if I could leave you with one thought this evening it's simply this you can tear up a copy of God's word but you can't make it go away it doesn't make it any less valid it's a foolish civil leader who believes he or she can change what God says based upon how the culture is running or their own opinions or their own desires you know we can't pick and choose who's that idiot uh, Piers Morgan who said obviously our Bible needs to change he said that uh, several years ago five or six years ago he was talking about how uh, well the culture is going this way and the culture is going that way therefore you know, all this stuff that we have in the Bible it needs to be revised <laughs> your culture needs to be revised you know, there's a righteous God with righteous judgment who will only sit and listen to it for so long before he brings the hammer down. And you can cut it up, you can burn it, you can throw it away, but it doesn't change a thing. You can even try to shoot the messenger. It doesn't change a thing. But there is also a just God who is a loving God who has given us a Savior whose name is Jesus Christ and there is none other. And he is responsible for the remission of sins. He is the way out. If you want to get rid of the judgment of the book of God, don't get rid of the book. Get rid of your sin that brings the judgment in the book. And you might be here tonight and you might not have a, one idea you may have never even considered that if tonight you were not to make it home, if tonight you were to die in the car, on the road, before in the parking lot even, uh, whether you'd go to heaven or hell, maybe you've not given it any consideration. But let tonight be the night. Because you can find a copy of it in spite of everything said here today or this week or in the past and burn a copy of it just for spite. It won't make it any less true, folks. You can't close your eyes and get away from it. Whether we realize it or not, it governs every aspect of our lives. The Lord was even said to be the Lord uh, Jehoiakim's God. Jehoiakim did not worship the Lord like he should have, but it didn't make any less the fact that the Lord was Jehoiakim's God. Jehoiakim just didn't know it. Folks, we live around all sorts of people who make all sorts of excuses, who get all sorts of upset every time the word of God is preached or listened to. But they can't get away from it. We're going to have to answer to him one day. And I'm not sure if you've ever thought of it, but part of their answer we're going to be responsible for. Why did he answer thus? Oh, well, you know, uh, Lord, I didn't uh, really take time to tell him. Oh, okay. We can't pick and choose. Context is king. It determines everything about our outlook in the Scripture, how we interpret the Bible. There are no new attributes of God introduced in the New Testament. They're all written down in the Old Testament first. And that is so that when Jesus Christ came along, claiming to be God, everybody on the earth would have something to refer to and determine whether those claims were accurate. Folks, they need the whole message. And sometimes it's uncomfortable to give it, and sometimes it, it hurts the recipient. 
but it's nothing like the hurt that the judgment of God will bring. Folks, you ought to love them enough to tell them about Jesus. Write them a letter, and if they tear that up and throw it in the fire, write them another one. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Just.